The next speaker um, is a result of some of the things that we did in the programming committee. Um, and you know, the, one of the goals was actually to program the London conference to be even better than the US conference. So one of the things that we did was go through all of the years of the DevOps Enterprise Summit and go through and really identify our, our favorite talks. And the, the talk that kept on coming up over and over again was Jeffrey Snover, technical fellow at Microsoft, who spoke at DevOps Enterprise 2015. In my opinion, this is actually one of the most astonishing presentations I've ever heard because we learned the inside story of Jeffrey's 13-year journey to take Windows out of Windows Server. I think it's simultaneously one of the most heroic journeys I've ever heard of, told against a backdrop of products and technologies that I grew up with. Uh, but it also shows how Jeffrey used every bit of influence he had and over the years built an ever-growing coalition uh, that eventually helped him achieve that vision. And I think it's something that everyone will appreciate and I think it's something that we can all learn from. Uh, as a technology fellow, uh, he is a, one of the top 11 individual contributors at Microsoft where he helps shape strategy and helps contribute to the achievements of that strategy. And he's one of these people that I, every time I interact with him, I feel like I get a little bit smarter. So, Jeffrey Snover. Howdy. Today I'm going to talk to you about three things. I'm going to talk to you about how transitions, the role transitions play in your career. I'm going to talk about how transitions, the role transitions have played in my career, particularly around um, taking the windows out of windows and out of windows server or command line interfaces and powershell and i'm going to talk about uh, this big transition that's happening in the industry digital transformation and how this provides you an opportunity to supercharge your career and that's my goal my goal is to help you get this dynamic in focus so that you can uh, make some changes and supercharge your career so, I'm Jeffrey Snover. I am a technical fellow at Microsoft. I am the chief architect for Azure Storage and our Cloud Edge work. I'm also the chief architect for Azure Stack, and, but most people know me as the inventor of PowerShell. I work for Microsoft. Microsoft has about 120,000 employees. Uh, we have a $90 billion in revenue, and we are in a race to become the first company with a trillion dollar market capitalization. So, pretty big company. Now, I want to do a survey to get my audience, okay? So, how many of you believe in the hype of digital transformation? I'd like you to raise your hands. Okay, now keep your hands up, keep your hands up. Uh, everybody else, how many of you plan to retire in the next three years? Okay, if you have your hands down, you should pay attention. Seriously, you need to pay attention to this talk. Okay, there are two types of jobs. The way I think of it is there's stair jobs, right? Stair jobs during normal periods, you climb up the stairs of your career slowly, there's somebody in front of you, and then every now and again things go wrong, okay? But slowly but steadily you'll go advance in your career. And then there are these periods of disruption where everything changes and it's an opportunity for your career to advance or to, as we saw in the previous slide, go the other direction. And these time, periods are what I call the elevator jobs, a period of time where for some reason things line up nicely and you're able to go up one, two, three levels of your career in a relatively short period of time. And I know that there are a number of you in the audience who've experienced this with your DevOps journey. So it's really quite exciting. So basically the point I want to make is that there are these transitions. And with a transition, it can really be the wind in your sail, right? It can help you a lot. Or not, right? Transitions can be tricky. Again, the key point is that during a transition, there are new winners and there are new losers. So you want to get this in focus because there's a difference between those two, okay? And you want to be the guy in the previous thing. All right, so you all heard of Facebook. Well, it turns out there was a Facebook before Facebook. I once took the family on a winter vacation down to San Diego, and we were walking around SeaWorld when all of a sudden I heard this big booming voice, hey, Jeffrey. I looked around, it was Steve Ballmer. Steve Ballmer, CEO of Microsoft, one of the richest guys in the world. 
and he's shouting out, hey, Jeffrey, at SeaWorld. It's like, what the heck's this? He comes over, and we have this long talk, and it's like, oh, that's great. What the heck just happened? And I mentioned it to some, someone afterwards, and he said, yeah, because you're in his Facebook. I said, what are you talking about? He says, well, Steve has a three-ring binder next to his bed with, um, it, with a page for all the pe key people in the company. And it's got your picture, and it's got what you're working on, and your background, and it's his Facebook. And every night he looks through that and uh, sees, you know, all the people moving his business forward. So you're in his Facebook. I said, wow, that's odd. I didn't know that. Now, being a technical fellow, I get to participate in the review of the performance and the reward conversations for a lot of senior people. And the conversations typically go like this. Who are the people moving this business forward? We identify those people, and then we ask the next round of questions. How are they doing? Are they secure in the socket, or are they loose? How do we need, are they happy? How do we reward them? How do we keep them in the boat, okay? And guess what? We compensate them at Microsoft. We compensate them very well. But like everyone else in this room, we have a budget. And when we take a big group, a bunch of money, and we hand it to the people who are moving our business forward, it comes from somewhere. And it comes from the people who aren't moving the business forward. So guess what? You want to be one of those people moving the business forward. Now I'm going to take a shift and talk about transitions in my career and how that has helped me, and sometimes when it didn't help me. I start off as a Unix developer. This picture is, is like oddly accurate. You know, that's not me, but it, it could well be, with the exception of the hair. I actually had wore pants like that for many, many years. Uh, so I was a Unix developer for many, many years, and I went to work at Digital. And at Digital, um, you know, I had a stair job. You know, uh, Unix was not critical to the success of, of Digital, and uh, I was doing fine, but, uh, and then at some point, Digital got involved with NT. Microsoft invented NT, and digital got involved in it, and I was all in. I was very thrilled about this technology. Fantastic real operating system by Dave frickin' Cutler. Dave Cutler uh, is working with these guys, producing NT, but running on PC economics hardware. Incredible. So I went all in on this transition to NT. Right? I read everything. I mean, there was nothing you've written about NT that I didn't read. Uh, I evangelized. I went around the company telling people why this was important, what they needed to do, help them get their projects started. And at some point, we had one of the biggest projects, NT projects the company had. We were partnering with IBM to port NetView to NT. And they tap me on the shoulder and they say, hey, we'd like you to be the architect for that project. And I grabbed that, and we just had a blast. It was fun. I worked my butt off. This was not a period in my life that I would call work-life balance. No, no, not at all. Uh, but I was just having a blast. We won a number of awards, uh, et cetera. And this was my elevator job. Okay, because in fairly quick order, you know, we released that, took a while, but released that, and then things worked out very well for me. I became a digital consulting engineer. This is a big deal, okay? These are some other digital consulting engineers, Dave frickin' Cutler, Bill frickin' Lang. If you, in fact, you know, if you go take a look uh, at the Wikipedia page on Turing Award winners, a shocking number of Turing Award winners have all been digital consulting engineers. This was really quite a, an elite club in the industry. Now, whereas that transition was doing very well for me, the industry was also going through a big transition. And the industry was transitioning from a vertical integration industry into a horizontal integration industry. Okay. By the way, that's interesting because the industry is, in fact, moving back to vertical integration. But that's the subject of another talk. Digital did not survive this transition. In fact, it was Bill Gates who said, most people get the decline of DEC all wrong. The reality is that digital declined because they were excellent at something that no longer mattered. They were excellent at something that no longer mattered, and therefore they died. 
Part of dying was, took many years, and they sold things off, one by one by one. They took my division, the management division, they sold us to computer associates. I met with Charles Wong, decided he was insane, and did not want to work for him. So instead, I cold called their competitors, a company called Tivoli, and I said, hey, why don't you hire me, I'll take my product and my team, and we'll go compete against these guys. And I, I, that's what happened. And so I worked at Tivoli for a number of years where I ran their um, uh, network management uh, development effort for a number of years. That was very successful, going along great, <clears throat> until one day, one day, the CTO of Tivoli asked me out to lunch. Went to a barbecue place, we're having a nice conversation, and he said the following, Jeffrey, you're one of my hardest working, smartest guys, you're doing great, I love it. I said, okay. He says, but here's the issue. You're working on a product that every time I sell it, I earn $15,000. I said, yeah. He says, you're not working on the product that every time I sell it, I earn two to $20 million. So I just have one question for you, Jeffrey. Do you want to be relevant? Wow, wow. I had what I think the alcoholics call a moment of clarity, <laughs> okay? Because I was passionate about my technology, right? It was NT, I was passionate about it. I went and did this incredible thing, uh, won all these awards, took my product on my team, did this crazy ass play, I moved to Texas to work on my project, and here he's telling me I'm not relevant because I'm not moving the business forward. And at the end I decided, well, actually impact more to, mattered more to me than technology, so I took that job, and that went very well. Eventually I got put on, on this guy's radar screen, and I got the call, and I went to work for Microsoft as the lead of all of their, lead architect for all their management technology and products. At the time, Microsoft was heavily focused in on the GUI, 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 GUI. If I can make it about the GUI, I win. So let's make it about the GUI. That was great, except I could see that there was gonna be a transition to very large data centers. And a GUI-centric world was not the right thing to do there, right? You needed automation. You needed lights out automation. And so I wrote down the Monad Manifesto, a new approach to Monad was Manifesto was the basis for Windows PowerShell. This was a, a fundamentally new approach to automation um, and I was in, I was totally in, I was gonna do it again. Now you've seen this, this org chart of Microsoft. Uh, I was, as they say, an industry hire, right? Bill Gates sponsored hiring me, um, came in a high level. I decided I was gonna be all in on this automation technology to take advantage of this transition and was demoted. Yes, I was. Um, and that lasted five years. Okay, so now, You've heard of this thing called Vista. So fine, I was demoted. I didn't care so much, because again, I get very passionate about technology, and I just knew this was like the best technology I had ever come with. It was so, again, moment of clarity. I had a moment of clarity. This is the right way to do automation. The other ways are wrong. This is right. I'm gonna pursue this. There's a, there's a pony here, and I did. <clears throat> So while that was going on, there was something called Windows Vista. Does anybody remember Windows Vista? Yeah, not our finest release. Now everybody knows, everybody, here's the thing, everybody knows it was not our finest release, but they forget that Vista was the save. Vista was the save. It was the save of what? Something called Longhorn. Longhorn, Bill was on this jihad to get everybody to transition to .NET. .NET, .NET, .NET. I mean, a bunch of people were like, well, Bill says .NET, and did incredibly stupid engineering decisions, like trying to get .NET into the kernel, and like replacing the open dialog box with, uh, with .NET. So Notepad will go from 15K working set size to when you say save as, it would then balloon to 15 megabytes as .NET got paged in. Just crazily bad decision. So it was a disaster, disaster. And the, the uh, people got pretty angry, not at themselves for making stupid decisions, but they decided 
I'm so smart, it must be this .NET technology. And so the, within the Windows organization, there became this like never, ever, ever, ever use .NET. Like those application guys can use it, but us OS people never use .NET. And uh, it basically everyone abandoned .NET and they produced this, um, the, what we call the seven rules for using .NET in Windows. And these were incredibly hard, incredibly draconian rules that you had to uh, overcome in order to get .NET into Windows or to use .NET in Windows. Now I said everyone abandoned .NET, that's not true. Everyone but one. I did not abandon .NET. I knew it was great technology and it was the right technology for the problem I was solving. And so I withdrew from the Windows product developed this on the side and, oh, sorry, that began a difficult period. While I was still working on this, they found out, you know, this guy's working on, uh, on automation, on command line interfaces. It was the most miserable two or three years of my life. You cannot imagine how miserable they made my life. I had executives say things like this. Admins don't want command line interfaces. I said, yeah, well, what'd you do before you came to Microsoft? So I came here from college. I said, yeah, I knew that. Uh, <laughs> I had one executive literally pull me aside and say, Jeffrey, exactly what part of effing Windows, Windows is confusing you? It was a very, very difficult period. But I was absolutely convinced that I was on the right path, so I stuck with it. And basically, if they weren't gonna fire me, I was gonna get this technology out at the door. So what did I do? I found the coalition of the willing. The exchange team had the problem, they understood the problem, they saw the light of what I was doing and they became our partner. And every time they tried to kill me, I'd say, well, let's talk to the exchange guys. And the exchange guys would say, hey, I'm betting my multi-billion dollar a year business on this technology, what are you trying to do? And people would back off. So that provided me some protection. But then, then it was time to get back in Windows, right? Remember, there were the seven rules of getting .NET in. And I'm telling you, these were Herculean things. The heck with that, I'm in, right? Each one of these things, I nailed it. Hey, what's the status of that? It's green. The heck with green. It's got to be greener than green. You don't understand, man. They don't want us in. We've got to meet these things by a wide margin so there's unambiguously we are going to get in. And we did it. Every single one of these things we solved. We solved it well. We solved it by a wide margin. So we knocked on the door and we said, we're bringing PowerShell and .NET into Windows. And that's when I found out that there were eight rules <laughs> to using .NET in Windows, and you only find out about the eighth rule when you fit past the first seven. The eighth rule, you guessed it, <laughs> no .NET in Windows. But the reality is that there was this transition to large data centers, that people were being able to see it. They saw it there. And so the owners of the server business said, hey, wait a second. It's time to go revisit this conversation. And ultimately, that was successful, and I shipped Windows PowerShell in Windows. Hurrah. And that's me. <laughs> yeah. It was a pretty happy day. Okay, so I became a hero, happy days. I eventually got my uh, promotion back, right? So it took me five, five years. Uh, at some point we had a, a, an executive before some event pulls me aside and says, wow, things have really changed for you. I said, yeah, they have. He says, you were a pariah for years. I said, yeah. He says, well, we were rooting for you. I said, really? I never knew that. <laughs> if, if you ever were rooting for somebody, Please, do them a favor, go tell them. It really would have helped. <laughs> anyway, so remember this, performance evaluations, what do we do? We take all the money and we give it to the people moving the business forward. Well, guess what? For five years, I was not viewed as the guy moving the business forward. So this effort cost me a lot of money, okay? But eventually, I got my position back and then People are like, yeah, this is great stuff. This is really important to our business. I got promoted to distinguished uh, engineer, and then I was the chief architect of System Center, and then the chief architect for Windows Server. Chief architect 
for a Windows server. Let me tell you, that's what you put on the front of your tombstone, right? On the back, on the back, you might say, oh yeah, he was a loving father and husband, and we go, whatever. But on the front, you put chief architect for Windows frickin' server. I mean, this is a big deal, right? Now, now it turns out at Microsoft, right, there've only been three chief architects for Windows Server. Dave frickin' Cutler, Bill frickin' Lang, and me. Now, I have no idea how I got on that list in that club, but I'm in it and I'm owning it. Okay, this is a big deal. Eventually, I became technical fellow. Now, that's the top of the rung, right? My joke is I can no longer be promoted. Um, indeed, of 120,000 employees, we have about 11 technical fellow individual contributors. So this is, this is a, a big deal. So as to paraphrase Garrett Morris, uh, trade data center, large data center transition been very, very good to me. Now again, the point is when there's this inflection point, sometimes you go up, sometimes you go down, and if you get the timing wrong, sometimes it goes down before it goes up, okay? So just because there's a transition doesn't mean that it's gonna help you, and it doesn't mean it's gonna happen on the time frame you think it's gonna happen, okay? Now, big transition. In fact, I think this is the biggest transition uh, we will see in our careers. I could be wrong, but I'm pretty sure of this. And this is the transition uh, that Mark Andreessen identified in his paper, Why Software is Eating the World. If you have not read this paper, you should read it, but here's the gist of it. He says, software is eating the world. One, it's eating traditional businesses. Traditional businesses are being replaced by software businesses. Bookstores by Amazon, ads by Google, uh, telecom by Skype, recruiting, LinkedIn, et cetera. But even for the industries that software is not replacing, software is, is, is responsible for a large and growing share of the value of the product. So cars are a great example. We got one in the lobby, right? It's not a piece of code, but there's a lot of code in it. Cars today have somewhere between 10 and 100 millions of lines of code in the car. They do things like safety and engine control. They do entertain passengers. They do navigation. They do connectivity. Software comprises a lot of the value of the physical object, the car, okay? These are the two key dynamics. He said, Companies in every industry need to assume that a software revolution is coming. Now, here is a list of the top companies in the world ranked by market capitalization in 2017. The highlighted ones are businesses whose value is largely driven, or primarily driven through software. That's over half. This is that same list in 2011 when Mark Andreessen wrote that document. The highlighted ones are the ones whose business are primarily driven through software. Okay, so he pointed out the phenomena and this was the world. And now, oh, and now a few years later, over half of the top companies are primarily driven by software. This is the largest transition we will experience in our careers. Yeah, whether it's banking, uh, retail, or automotives, each one of the major players are all figuring this out. They're figuring out, they're not looking at their, their traditional competitors, they're looking at the disruptors, they're looking to Silicon Valley for the potential threats to their business. Microsoft bought LinkedIn last week at our, our staff meeting with Sacha. He said that LinkedIn, we do a lot of recruiting, we found that more jobs for developers are, being, are going to the industries outside of technology than inside of technology. Okay, more programmers being hired outside tech than inside tech. That's crazy. Great. Now, you've heard of Moore's Law, doubling of CPU or transistors every year, one of the foundations of our industry. I'm here to tell you, not so important. Not so important. There's another Moore's Law. This one is really important. This one is Jeffrey Moore. And the Jeffrey Moore's Law 
is more important to the next 20 years than Moore's Law was for the last 20 years. Jeffrey Moore said, every business participates in two activities, core activities and context activities. Core activities are those things you want to invest in because they deliver differentiated value to your customers and you can charge a premium for them. Context activities, everything else. Let me give you an example. Microsoft, our core is software. Okay? Software that helps people do more. So we invest, we try and find the world's best talent to help us do that. We scour the world looking for people to help us do that. We invest very help heavily in that. We make sure that they are happy, etc. Context, in order to do that, we have to have receptionists. We have to have cafeterias. We have to have shuttles. We have no technical fellow of the cafeterias. No distinguished engineers of the shuttles. No vice president of the receptionists. We want these things, we need these things, we pay a lot of money for them, but Satya Nadella has never held a senior leadership team to discuss the menu for next week, and the lunch menu, right? We focus all of our energy here, but we do things, we just write checks there. Now, there's an interesting complication, and it's a complication that the people in this room are gonna succeed or fail on. And that's this idea of mission critical. Now the definition of mission critical is, screw up, you're in big trouble. Like you can't screw up. But notice it's on the, it's on the horizontal plane. So how could you have mission critical core? Of course, that's great, right? That's where you wanna focus. But there's also this mission critical context. Like what's that about? And the answer is that's where the risk is, right? And Jeffrey Moore called this the killing field of once great companies. Because once you have that core mission critical, over time, and you're making a lot of money, over time the market will respond. It'll have a substitution. Uh, other competitors will come in. There'll be a different play. And you are no longer able to charge a premium for it. So it's no longer core, it becomes context. But it's still mission critical. If you screw it up, you're in big trouble because you still get a lot of your, your revenue from it. Now because often to get in this first square you incur a lot of technical debt, people continue to invest in mission critical context activities and that's where they die. So the challenge is in managing that mission critical core in order to invest in the mission critical, no, manage the mission critical context so you can invest in mission critical core. I'm gonna tell you how to do it, right? And by the way, I know a lot of you know this story, but I've found as we talk about uh, 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 digital transformation, a lot of your peers don't, and a lot of the literature on it, I find is not particularly helpful. I have found this framing of the digital transformation to be very effective in helping people, your peers, get through the knothole and understand the world, understand what's important. Okay, so, you gotta do two things. You gotta create bandwidth, you gotta invest in innovation. How do you apply the other Moore's Law? You transition from the way the world is to the way the world's going. The world's going to the cloud, both on-premises and off-premises. And you want to create bandwidth by using software as a service, by doing lift and shift. Just by running your VMs in a cloud, you gain bandwidth because those environments deal with all the hardware management, they have management tools, and then you do some lift and modernize, put some of these things in containers. Small amount of work, nice benefit. But then you invest in innovation. Don't be confused here. This is a separate, distinct activity. You invest in innovation. And when you invest in innovation, you really wanna go cloud native. The difference between cloud native and some of these other things is that cloud native has a better portion of your energy focused in on what matters. The conversation with the customer to gain insight, to translate into a feature, to be delivered as quickly as possible and again, and again, and again. So when you're messing around with a virtual machine that needs to be patched and a registry key and a comp file here, blah, right? Things like serverless uh, functions uh, make a ton of value. They do more of the work for you. So when you're investing in innovation, you really wanna use these new cloud models. Okay, so what does that do to IT spend? Shifts it from context to core. 
by buying infrastructure, software as a service, and automating, and investing. You invest in innovation and you automate. You automate on one side to create bandwidth. You automate on the other side to have repeatable processes that can get better through every iteration. The heart, the heart of digital transformation is this. Build the things that differentiate you, buy the things that don't. Build the things that differentiate you, buy the things you don't. This transition is gonna need new heroes. You are those heroes. So here's a set of starts and stops, okay? Start, stop, clicking next. If you're just clicking next on a dialog box, you are not adding any value to your company, stop it. Learn how to automate. It's tough, tough. Do it. Number two, uh, stop crafting no value add solutions. Look, if you're running exchange, stop it, honestly. If you're in the airline business, can you get more people in your planes because you run mail better than the other guys? No, no. Now it's mission critical, so it can't screw it up, but there are people, we, we will run exchange for you. There are a lot of software as a services that you're not adding any value to. You're just getting up and running. If you can buy them from someone else, it costs you money, but it frees up your people, frees up your talent. Stop building snowflake servers or snowflake clouds, right? Embrace DevOps. Stop leveraging these low leverage, using low leverage architectures and leverage the cloud. Learn these new architectures that allow you to focus more of your team on the customer conversation and less on the technology. Here's the deal. This is all hard stuff. Nobody's confused about this. And, and uncomfortable is the new normal. Every single day I walk into the office and I'm afraid I'm gonna get fired. I'm afraid I'm gonna bring out my badge and it's, instead of turning green, it's gonna turn red. Because I have no idea what the heck I'm doing. But you just keep doing it. And you know what, next day's better than the day before and the next day's better. But you're, oh, and then, and then you start to get comfortable and they'll say, oh, guess what, there's this new thing. Oh, God. And so, and the pace of things are such that you're always gonna be uncomfortable. Live with it, learn to embrace it, learn to push through it. Lastly, stop dialing it in, right? Invest in your career, okay? You're here, you're investing in your career, that's great. So you wanna be this guy where transitions are putting the wind in your sail and you don't wanna be this guy because remember, when it comes review time and it comes reward time, we pay attention to the people who are moving the business forward and we reward them. And there's a fixed budget. So the rewards for those people come from the people who are not moving the business forward. Every transition has new winners and new losers. So I hope you can use this knowledge to navigate changes in your career. I'm Jeffrey Snover. Thank you very much for your time. <laughs>